Hi, I'm Bill Arnold. Thank you for listening to this podcast. There are many more podcasts available at MyFaithRadio.com. Your support makes this possible. Thank you. Bye. And a warm welcome. It's the Afternoon Show with Bill Arnold. I'm Than Bennett, in for Bill today. And I have a question for you as we open our time today. Is there a spiritual art, a spiritual art to what you do? No matter what your career is or your hobby or your mission field or your station of life, is there a spiritual art to it? And if so, how do you cultivate that? And, and maybe if your answer is no, should there be a spiritual art to it? And how do you grow that? My guest today is Barry Rowan, and he has written a book to help us with these questions. It is titled The Spiritual Art of Business, Connecting the Daily with the Divine. So I'll introduce Barry to you in just a moment here. We'll get him on the show. But first, I, I, I've been sitting in this in this material today. And I just want to invite you to lean into this conversation with uh, an intentional posture here. I, I think there's something for each of us to learn from what Barry is presenting in this book, in this resource. And I want us to catch it. I, I was thinking of Ecclesiastes chapter nine, really the whole book of Ecclesiastes. There is a there is sort of a sense of hopelessness through the book of Ecclesiastes. Several, several times in the book, the writer says that everything is meaningless. So just this sense of hopelessness. And yet in the middle of all of that, it gives us this instruction that I want to keep in the front of your mind as we have this conversation with Barry. It says this, whatever your hand finds to do, do it with all your might. So Barry's going to challenge us in that from the perspective of business, and that's going to speak to many of us. But no matter your station in life, I want you to apply the principles that Barry is going to talk about and that he is going to offer to your station in life. I think you're going to find it uh, very tangible, very practical, and I think it's going to be encouraging in your walk with Jesus. So let's get Barry on the show. Let me introduce him to you. Barry Rowan has spent his career in C-suites. He is a turnaround specialist. He's done that with eight businesses now, focusing on the technology and communication sectors. He's also served on a number of boards, including World Vision, InterVarsity, and he chairs the board of the Harvard Business School Christian Fellowship and Alumni Association. Barry is now investing all that experience into developing the next generation of business leaders, and it's what compelled him to write this book that we are drawing from today. Again, the title is The Spiritual Art of Business, Connecting the Daily with the Divine. Barry Rowan, welcome to the Afternoon Show. Thanks very much, Stan. It's my pleasure to be here with you. Really excited to be having this conversation, and I, I love the concept of this book, especially coming from someone uh, with your level of experience. But before we before we dive into the book, let's get to know you just just a little bit better. Tell us a little bit about you. Tell us a little bit about your family, and and maybe tell us a little bit about what makes you a turnaround expert in the field of business. Sure. Well, I, I grew up in. In uh, Idaho, for those of you who are listening, um, ah. was the son of two veterinarians and um, was raised in the faith. My dad was of Jewish heritage. My mom was Catholic, so we were raised Catholic. But And I really didn't understand what it meant to surrender our lives to Christ. And that was the beginning of transformation. Uh, so that started in my late 30s, or excuse me, late 20s. Um, and it really put us on a journey toward discovery and ever-deepening surrender to God. Uh, I've been married to Linda. For 42 years, we have two sons, Mark and David, in their mid-30s, and we're grateful for the character that they have and the, their uh, own walk with our dear Lord. And uh, so what brought me into doing turnarounds, I would have never guessed that that would have been what I've done. As you mentioned, I uh, built or turned around eight businesses, one selling for $10 billion, so uh, with some scale. Um, but because uh, I'm basically a nice guy, <laughs> but I love the complexity. I love the challenge of hyper growth. We had, uh, I went from startup companies to a business that grew from startup to several thousand employees. And I love the challenge of those kinds of things and, and really seeing the opportunity to build businesses that 
create jobs and serve customers and create value in ways that um, has an impact and a lasting impact on society. That's great. There's a number of things there I want to follow up on. First of all, I like how you mentioned the $10 billion p- figure, which is, you know, a number I can't even get my mind around. And you, you, you had to assure us after saying that, that you're still a nice guy. I like how that uh, maybe suggests something otherwise. I, I don't, I never would have imagined that. But the second thing is uh, my wife grew up in Idaho in, in the Valley. So I'm just wondering whereabouts in Idaho. I grew up in a small town uh, called Weezer, Idaho, 70 miles west mm-hmm. of Boise. Interestingly, my dad grew up in New York City, uh, mm-hmm. and when he was in uh, high school, rode his bicycle out to Yellowstone uh, with a buddy and spent the summer there, fell in love with the West. And my mom grew up in South America, so she graduated from uh, high school in Chile and then was the only woman in her class at Cornell Veterinary School. And they met in this small town, fell in love, and that's where we spent our life was being raised in rural Idaho. Amazing. I love hearing those stories. It's beautiful country. Uh, we love to visit, love to ski out there. So that it's a small world. I uh, also look forward to hearing about that, uh, the background, the Jewish and, and Catholic background of finding a faith in Jesus Christ. That's uh, an amazing journey. Let me, let me ask about the book a little bit. Let me, let me start by doing this. You know, Barry, when, when I write, it's almost always out of something that I'm sort of in the midst of, right? That I'm in process on. And, you know, certainly I I try to weave in my experience, but it's very often primarily something that I am working through myself and maybe, you know, maybe far from sort of a finished product. And I know you say that this book grew out of an effort to find meaning in your work. So why why don't you tell us about that? How did how did your effort to find meaning in your work prompt you to write this book? Well, I came uh, really, as I mentioned, to a surrendered faith out of a crisis of meaning and work. And in my late 20s, I had graduated from Harvard Business School, uh, had joined a startup company that was growing fast, was the 110th fastest growing company in the U.S. And and, uh, yet I felt this ache of hollowness within me. And I was invited to to a young life camp in Colorado and climbed up on a rock above this camp and just started weeping. And as I looked out over this beautiful Arkansas River Valley, and uh, it was the juxtaposition of the serenity of that environment stood in just such striking contrast to this turmoil within me. And I've since realized that the harmony of nature reveals the disharmony in me. And that was certainly what was going on. And I thought it was a crisis of meaning and work, which it was. But God had to broaden my perspective and show me that uh, I had to have a clear sense of purpose in life in order to provide a context to understand meaning and work. So I spent the next eight months reading 16 books. I stopped going to church because I thought it was hypocritical to worship a God I no longer knew existed. And then uh, finally, through the fog, uh, emerged a conclusion that I I would said I would put my weight down uh, on the belief that God exists. But it was, as the lawyers would say, based on the preponderance of the evidence. It wasn't like Mm. a, a slam dunk. And then the question became, well, who are you going to live your life for, God or yourself? And what are you going to do about Jesus? And I realized that if he is who he says he is, we need to take him literally at his word. And his words, any of you who does not give up everything he has can't be my disciple, just penetrated me. And I could Mm. see that it was a call to surrender. And ultimately, I did surrender my life to him on a run around the lake by our house. And I basically said, I gave, I give up, but it was kicking and screaming as I came into the kingdom of heaven. But even after doing that, I still couldn't put the pieces together. I couldn't, it didn't answer the question of meaning and work. And the test for me was, how do I connect what I'm doing in this moment with my purpose in life? And I would spend the next eight years writing 350 pages to myself, mostly in the middle of the night, wrestling with this question. Hmm. And finally, those pieces began to snap into place. And God took me through what I would describe as a succession of paradigm shifts. I was just thinking about work and life uh, all wrong. And I had it so wrong for so long. And he just had to uh, really invert my perspective of work. And and as I came into this deeper understanding of what it meant to uh, live our lives fully for God in the world, it animated my work life and has for the last 25 years. And and to your question about why did I write the book, you know, I've spoken all over the world on this subject, from Harvard Business School to the Philippines at the Global Workplace Forum for Lausanne. And as I do that, people um, 
I see you have the same kinds of questions. And almost every time somebody would say, would you just write this down for us? I want to think more about these things. And and so it's largely autobiographical, but I think it's also a sketch of our shared humanity. And as the literary people say, what is most deeply true for us as individuals is most universally true for others. And I'm finding that to be the case. So my hope is it can be helpful to people. And I don't really consider it a book. I consider it an invitation into a conversation with God about things that matter, that mm -hmm. people might develop a life-giving perspective of their work as seen through the eyes of God, and not only their work, but their our entire lives. Yeah, I read that actually in the introduction. I want to ask you about that in greater detail in just a moment here, Barry. My guest is Barry Rowan. The book is The Spiritual Art of Business, Connecting the Daily with the divine. I love so much uh, about that story. I love how God uses events, regular events in our life. I love how he speaks through uh, nature. I can certainly relate to um, at times uh, my faith being an exercise of the mind over the heart. I love how God presses through and, and really asks for our heart as well, of our, as well as our mind. I also love that you wrote first to yourself, Barry. I, I, I really just find that when that is the case, the words that land on a paper have on the paper have so much more application uh, for the people that read them. Let me let me dig in a little bit here. Let me let me ask about dollars and cents. You you talked about this a, a minute ago, but you know the bottom line. It's it's so often what business comes back to. You you are a follower of Jesus, and and the bottom line, dollars and cents is is not the bottom line for a follower of Jesus. But you spent forty years in the industry, very successful years. You mentioned a moment ago that one of your turnarounds sold for ten billion dollars. I still can't get my mind around that figure, but, but talk to us, if you would, about how you navigated that tension it, it, or to the extent that there was one, was there a tension between the bottom line and a, and a focus on what it may be the, the health and the holiness of, I think both your soul and the souls around you. How, how did you navigate that? Yeah. That tension raised huge questions in me, then. And, uh, I, said if if it, if this is about making money uh, and that's the purpose of business i'm sorry but it just doesn't get me out of bed in the morning and i was uh, going through this process of trying to understand really my purpose in life and then hopefully to understand some sense about the purpose of business and uh, i realized that we can have a life-giving or life-draining perspective of virtually any job. And the mistake I was making, one of many, was I was living life from the outside in instead of the inside out. I thought, hmm. if I just get the right job, somehow I'll be filled up. And came to really realize, of course, that there are no perfect jobs. There's only a perfect God. And the corollary to that is that I was trying to derive meaning from my work instead of bringing meaning to the work. And it's God's perspective of the work that is the source of its ultimate meaning. So if we have a higher purpose to what we're doing, it can animate the work we do every moment with a sanctity that makes it come alive and makes us come alive. And so as I, I began to see that, I really prayed about, well, what is what is the life-giving perspective of my work? And it started really riding on a bus from uh, one of those outlying parking lots uh, at the airport. And there was this woman driving the bus who seemed to love her job. And and I, of course, she ride on these buses and who would like a job like that? And yet she was chatting it up with the customers. And I was the last person to get off and, and said, could I ask you a question? And she said, sure. I said, do you like your job? And she said, I love my job. And I said, why do you like your job? And she said, I meet interesting people going interesting places. Hmm. And it was not a trace of guile in her answer. It was genuine. And I thought, wow, if somebody like her can bring a life-giving perspective to their work, can I not do that? At the time, I was the chief financial officer for a publicly traded company with 2,500 employees. And, and so I said, that that's the challenge for me, is how do I bring a life-giving perspective of my work as seen through the eyes of God? And that led to a perspective that has animated my work life. And out of the fog kind of emerged a working job definition, which is to contribute to a better society as seen through the eyes of God. Mm -hmm. And if that's my job definition, I'm called to business, then what is the role of business in contributing to a better society? And after, again, wrestling with that for a long time, I came to an understanding for me that really worked and energized my career. And I like four things in my view, we can talk more about that. It's uh, responsible value creation that Business is really the one institution that creates economic value. Most every other institution distributes it. It uh, 
It's serving customers because when we're serving customers, we're literally serving God. It's creating an environment for employees that enables us all to grow into the full expression of ourselves in the 100,000 hours or so that we're going to work. And finally, it's being a good corporate citizen. When I was working at one company, we were one of the large providers of communications to Japan. And when the tsunami hit, as I was there, we offered free calling to Japan. It was just something we could do in the context of the service we provided. So then I could make this connection between what I'm doing in the moment and purpose in life. So, um, and we can talk more about that, but that, that ability to connect those dots was what uh, really made me come alive. And I've seen come alive, make other people come alive for similar reasons. I'd love to dig into those four areas a little bit as we go along. Barry, I love that response so much. That's that's really uh, why I led into the conversation the way that I did. I, I, I want you to I want those who are listening to hear Barry's principles and be able to apply them. No matter maybe your job is driving that that bus at the airport, these principles still apply. And I love love what you said, Barry. We're going to take a short break here, but let me just let me just go to a break with this reminder. You said there are no perfect jobs. Only a perfect God, no matter where our station in life is, if we're living from the inside out, from that place where, where, where God has filled us and we can offer that gift to those around us, then the place of employment is really um, secondary. That doesn't mean it's not important. It's, it's very important. But in fact, that's what allows you to have fulfillment in that station of life. So I really appreciate that, Barry. Appreciate you being with us. We're going to pick the conversation up on the other side of this break. Again, I am Than Bennett sitting in for Bill today on the afternoon show. My guest is Barry Rowan. His book is The Spiritual Art of Business, Connecting the Daily with the Divine. And we'll be back with more right after this. Hi, this is Bill Arnold. You might be the kind of person that goes to Paris and still listens to Faith Radio on the app. Or you might be more like the person that goes into the next room in your apartment and listens. The good news is, is using the app is just as easy in both places. Downloading the free app is crazy easy. Just text the word app to 877-933-2484 and click the link. And if you happen to be in Paris, there is a really nice little coffee shop not far from the Eiffel Tower that serves a really nice chocolate biscotti. The afternoon show with Bill Arnold. I'm Than Bennett in for Bill today. My guest is Barry Rowan. He's written a book called The Spiritual Art of Business, Connecting the Daily with the Divine. We're drawing on his experience in the field of business to learn how we can better apply uh, wherever we are, whatever our station of life is, whatever our employment is to the glory of God. Barry writes this in the introduction of the book, and he, he referenced this a moment ago, but this, this really stood out to me as I was sitting with the book uh, today. He wrote... This is a different kind of book from most others you've read. It is intended not so much to be read as to be experienced. It is, it is designed to be a gateway to prayer, a chance for you to stop, to be with God. It is an invitation into a conversation with God about the things that matter. I encourage you to read it slowly, to absorb it, reflecting on how these ideas apply to you. It is not meant as a task to be completed, but as a meal to be enjoyed. Barry, I, I love that. Why, why don't you take just a moment to speak to what you hope the reader is going to take away from applying this, um, this different approach to reading your book? Yes, I'd be happy to, Than. Um, well, as you pointed out, the book is, I think, meant to be enjoyed and experienced. It's 40 days of guided meditations to help people develop a life-giving perspective of their work as seen through the eyes of God. So it starts with a scripture uh, and then a key takeaway. And then I share stories out of my own life, including many foibles and shortcomings. Hmm. But then importantly, each little chapter of 40 days ends with a set of reflection questions. And my hope is that those questions lead into this conversation with God and that it will meet people where they are. It'll scratch people where they itch. And so it's not about me telling my story so much as it is holding myself up as a mirror in the sense that we see our story and the stories of others. So I hope that people will see their own story as their own sacred story is being written by God. 
Uh, and I think it will take people in different directions depending on their starting point. You know, what can be right for one can be wrong for another, depending on on your starting point. And so that's my hope is it'll be a very personalized experience and people will end up uh, entering into this, this conversation with God and enter into this intimacy with him. And out of that can flow his spirit into the world and make the world a better place in some small way. You talked a moment ago, Barry, about uh, the four areas, the four things that we can draw from our work. And I, I do want to unpack that in a minute. But before we get there, I, I, this, this might sound a little bit uh, blunt, but I, I, I just wonder, like, how, how should we look at work? What are, what, are, what are maybe some of the wrong ways to look at work based on your experience and maybe based on some of those, um, uh, you, you call them failures that, that you had? But maybe turning that more optimistically, what would be a biblical approach to work? What would that look like? Well, importantly, uh, work was established before the fall, and I'm sure many of our listeners are aware of that. But uh, but in the early part of Genesis, the, there was no one to till the land, and shrubs had not gone up because God had not the, brought the rain, and there was no one to till the land. So I think because we are made in the image of God, and God is a creator uh, and himself works, we are designed for work, and it's an important part of who we are. And I think a, a, a way to look at this is picking up on the conversation we're having about the inside out versus the outside in is that work is an expression of who we are. One of the key scriptures for me that has been helpful to understand that is out of Colossians, that it's the mystery that's been hidden throughout the ages that Christ in you, the hope of glory. And when we begin to see that it's Christ in us, as John the Baptist said, it's we must become less so he can become more. As we become less and the spirit of the living God becomes more in us, and it's no longer we who live, but Christ living in us, the very work we do is an expression of that spirit of the living God. And it's not just our work. It's everything. So uh, Lynn and I have been married for 42 years. Uh, my love for her, our love for our two sons, the work that I do, serving on the multitudinous boards that I've sat on, those are all expressions of Christ in us. And that as he comes into us, he flows out into the world. And so for me, that is a, a, a much more helpful understanding of work versus seeing work as just as a means of putting food on the table, which of course it's important. Um, or as a means, uh, even more inappropriately, is as a means of uh, glorifying ourselves or finding ourselves lifted up, or particularly as you get into more senior positions in organizations or start businesses, that there's great temptation to be served rather than to serve. There's great temptation to uh, pursue the shiny objects of this world through our work, like uh, money and wealth creation and those kinds of things. So, so I think God absolutely has a perspective of work that is life giving, but it's to the divine design. And hmm. they, we are happiest when we're, we're living within the design, divine design, rather than outside of it. I want to ask about the four uh, the four areas that you mentioned earlier. I I jotted them down quickly. I think I got them right. But the, the second and third ones were serving customers and creating an environment for employees, which I think are in incredibly important and I think uh, somewhat straightforward. But I, I wanted to ask you maybe about the first and the last, and, and you can take this uh, any way that you would like. But value creation this is this is something that I have been thinking a lot about, just in the terms in terms of the Christian walk that that there there that there needs to be something more than simply a, a, a head knowledge. There needs to be a, a creation and a building uh, that, that goes out into those around us. I, uh, Andy Crouch has written into this space a, a book called Culture Making, and I think you're saying something similar about the. The business world, and then the the, the fourth uh, area you mentioned is being good corporate citizens. And my hunch would be, correct me if I'm wrong, but my hunch would be that that one would be a little bit um, controversial. Is probably too strong of a word. I think everybody would agree we should be good corporate citizens. But I know there's a, I know there is a pressure to deliver for the shareholders. So so for it all to be about the bottom line. So. Maybe say a word or two about, about at least that first and that fourth one, value creation and then being good corporate citizens. Sure. Um, when when I was uh, trying to understand uh, my role in society, as I said, I, I came to this job definition 
contribute mm-hmm. to a better society is seen through the eyes of God. So if I'm called to business, what are the distinctives about business that represent uh, hopefully its godly role in society? And that's how I arrived at these four things. There certainly is a longer list, but these have been the ones that have been most helpful to me. So responsible value creation. So uh, it took me a long time to realize, why do I care so much about the stock price going up? in the businesses that I was involved with building. And of course, a part of it is uh, personal uh, gain as we align our interests with the shareholders. And you know, I suppose this side of heaven, there will always be a mixture of our motives, but there's something much bigger than that. And for example, we have been very involved with helping the, uh, the poor, particularly in Central America. Our family has made 22 trips to Central America, doing a variety of things, including bring wa- bringing clean water to the people there who we've fallen in love with. And you only have to get off the airplane in Tegucigalpa, Honduras, to say there's something different about this place. Mm-hmm. And well, there are lots of things that are different, but one of them is GDP per capita. And uh, it's not that money is the solution to the world's problems, But economic value creation is the hallmark or a hallmark of a well-functioning society Hmm. because it means that people are released to contribute up to their potential. And as societies do that, and it it takes people from oppression to expression, then it finds expression in value creation. And so it shows up as being able to sell goods and services for more than we charge for. That means people are willing to pay for it. So there's the economic value creation. There's also the creation of of human capital value as people, again, in our organizations are put in jobs that really enable them to express their talents and their giftedness and their passions. And uh, so I I love this definition of leadership, which is the full expression of oneself that Warren Bennis coined a number of years ago. And and so that's, to me, is a part of the role as a business leader or, or a leader of any organization is to create an environment that enables people to grow into the full expression of themselves. Uh, and then on the final point about being a good corporate citizen, uh, it, for me, is a way of thinking about broad-based definitions of success. And uh, I think that I had, knew a friend that ran a hospital one time that was a, a faith-based hospital and she was a wonderful leader. And she said, uh, no money, no mission. <laughs> In mm. other words, if we go out of business, we cannot serve the people that we are called to serve. And so I think we need to have, and to me, they're all highly connected by focusing on employees to enable them to uh, contribute up to their ability, by focusing on customers and serving them well and really understanding their needs the business will flourish much more with a set of priorities that are oriented around that. And then it, it's about giving back. I think as a, as a company in the same way as individuals, it's a gift for us to give back. I'm going to give you, I could give you endless examples. We talked about providing a free calling to Japan, but uh, in another company I was involved with, we were in the cell phone business and we had a lot of towers in Florida. And the hurricanes wiped out our cell towers and uh, the communications were necessary for the police and so on. So our executive team went down to Florida and we we cooked hamburgers for all the relief workers. And, and as we were reinstalling our cell towers, and it was just a way for us to support them, to serve them as they were serving the people of their counties. So uh, to me, it's, it's uh, an important part and dimension of business is being a corporate citizen that that not only looks to make money, but looks to be an example in the communities where people want to work and uh, will look up to. Amen and amen. I you think often about how we were created to be creative. So as you talk about value creation, I just I just remember that our God is creative. He made us to embody that creativity and and creating value for the world is one way we can do that. Barry, we're going to head to a short break. We'll pick the conversation up on the other side. Uh, if you are listening and you have a question for Barry about business or about how to apply these principles to your station of life, you can text those questions in to 877-933 2484. We'll work some of those questions into the conversation. I'm Than Bennett sitting in for Bill Arnold today. My guest is Barry Rowan. His book is The Spiritual Art of Business, Connecting the Daily with the Divine. And we'll have more conversation on the other side. It's the afternoon show. I'm Than Bennett in for Bill Arnold today, having a great conversation with Barry Rowan about 
how to use business or whatever your station in life is for the glory of God. Barry, I want to jump right back in here before the break. You were talking about how business is a vehicle for value creation and for being good corporate citizens. I, I want to ask, kind of kind of zoom out a little bit, and I have a feeling part of the answer might be the second and third points that you mentioned, which were serving the customer and creating an environment for the employees. But unpack this however, however you would like to. I think a, a lot of what is in the book for me, as, as, as I went through it, is rooted in this idea that God works through our work. And you've kind of been talking about that idea as, as we go along here. But I, I know there have been plenty of times for me that even though I believe that to be true, it's hard for me to see it on a day-to-day basis or, or a moment-by-moment basis. You know, when the, when the stress builds up and there's just a, a task list that has to be done, it's hard for me to see that. So say a word, if you would, about how to think about that. How does God work through our work? Yeah, let's talk about that at, in two dimensions then of with regard to us as individuals and with regard to the work that we are asked to do in the world. So with regard to us as individuals, God uses our work to do some of his most important work in us. And I have found that my career has been the crucible for the formation of my soul. I have grown more through my work life than any other aspect of my life. And what happens as we talk, as we go through this cycle of, of, and the process that God takes us through, I call it the, the um, cycle of the um, spiritual art of business that starts with surrender. As we surrender our lives to God, he transforms us into new creations. And then that new creation goes out into the world. And as it describes in Isaiah, as the rains come down and don't return to it without watering the earth, causing it to bud and flourish, so is true of the word of God. And so it's this meta cycle and this micro cycle. So that's true of our whole lives as we go through that kind of four point process. But it's also true in the micro, in the daily. And so so God uses our work to do his work in us. And in my case, and I think most of our cases, as we think about it, we are emptied of ourselves so we can be filled with him. Um, and as we do that, we are transformed so that he can transform the world through us. Very importantly, it's not we who are transforming the world. Uh, as we are emptied mm-hmm. and God is in us, it is God doing his work. And that's a hugely helpful, different way to think about it to me, because it's the difference between striving and, you know, abide in me and I will abide in you. So it takes the pressure off, particularly for achievement oriented people. So God, so that's the first form of work is that God does, does his work in us, but it also uh, through our work as a way of contributing to a better society. Uh, and I'll give you a, a couple of examples. So it's this connection between what we're doing in the moment and the value that the, the business is creating for society. So I had a friend that, for example, was a, a CEO of a, of a cleaning business and he went and visited a, a hospital in Russia and there was this woman who was mopping the floor and is just moving dirty water from one side of the floor to the other and really not making any difference and clearly did not enjoy her job and saw no purpose in it. And then he went to the UK and went to a hospital and there was a woman who was cleaning the floor who seemed to be taking great, great care with what she was doing. And he went up to her and said, I just want to thank you. You look like you do an amazing job as a janitor. And she said, oh, sir, I am not a janitor. I am a member of the medical team. See, mm-hmm. people come to the hospital and they often get sick because it's not clean. And my role is to create an environment of cleanliness so people don't get even more sick when they come to the hospital. And so she was able to connect what she was doing in that moment to the purpose of the business and then therefore her purpose in life. So if she was called to do that work, she could say every every swipe of the mop is a connection between God's purpose for me, which is to create an environment of cleanliness so people can be healed. So it just is a dramatically different way of looking at our work when we'd be able to make this connection. And and, And for me, that is what has brought my work life alive, is to be able to see if somebody's doing a formula in an Excel spreadsheet, how does that connect to my purpose in life? Well, let's say they're working on a, a, a business plan, a strategic plan, you want to get the, the, 
the cell uh, formula right so that the the model can be right so that the business can can be more successful so it can fulfill its literally god ordained sacred purpose in society of achieving those things that we've been talking about so now i can see how every moment of our lives of my life is connected to my purpose in life and uh really our lives are the summation of the moments of our lives so if we can see god's will embedded in every moment and God's purpose and his word embedded in every moment, then we can live lives that matter as the summation of those moments of our lives. That's so good. And I, I so appreciate how you connect the temptation to just strive for more. I shared I shared on maybe yesterday's broadcast about how early in my life I would I would sign notes with a little closing that said, keep striving. I, I just felt the need to constantly be reaching for more. And you're right. It put a pressure on um, and that pressure needed to be relieved. But I love how you connect that then to finding a greater purpose and a greater mission, because that really is the Christian walk. We are here for a greater purpose. It is not a, a one that is our own. It is a purpose of amplifying the name and the fame of the Almighty God. So I, I really, really appreciate that connection. Uh, Barry, let me ask you about, I know there's an online resource that goes along with the book. Maybe um, maybe tell us a little bit about that, how to use it, how to find it if, if someone has purchased the book, um, and how is that designed to be used? Sure. They can go to our website, which is www.barrylrowan.com, just my middle initial, barrylrowan.com. And on the homepage where the book is shown, if you just scroll down, you'll see there's an opportunity to download a discussion guide. And in the same spirit this that this book is not meant to just be read, but experienced. So this discussion guide is meant to be used in small groups. It takes people through five sessions. So the first four sessions are built around the primary segments of the book, surrender, transformation, new creations, and into the world. And then the fifth session is designed for people to really integrate that and say, what does this mean for me? And what am I going to go do differently as a result of this? And we've uh, seen people do this and, and really find it very valuable to to make it their own and to be able to put feet to the ideas. And, you know, I, I love concepts. I have a degree in chemistry. I, I uh, am a science guy. I love ideas, but ultimately it has to have a leg on the ground for me. So it has to have an impact and, and really uh, have something that is tangible and practical for people. So hopefully this will help. Yeah, I was actually going to ask about that, and I think you've you've pretty much answered the question, but I noted that, that there are four parts to uh, the book, Surrendered, Transformed, Realigned, and Sent. And you said a word about surrendered, appreciates uh, that very much, how it forms the foundation, everything kind of stems from there. But session uh, five in the, in the online resource, that is not in the book, correct? So if people want to, uh, to get that to supplement the book, they need to go to Barry L. Rowan. Uh, dot com. But I, I, I take it that personal integration is basically application. Is, is that right? Yeah, it's the results of responding to these reflection questions and the results of really hopefully the conversation with God about, Lord, what would you now have me do? And so it's very much like at Pentecost, you know, and after Peter spoke to them and they said, what shall we do? That's kind of a question that I think, I hope we all ask. And, and this is a way to be able to answer that in tangible ways and, and really do something practical with this, as opposed to reading an interesting book and having it sit on the shelf. I love it. So if you're going to get the book, I encourage you to go to barrylrowan.com, uh, download the online resource. And again, the the book itself is titled The Spiritual Art of Business, Connecting the Daily with the Divine, written by my guest, Barry Rowan. Barry, we're going to go to our final break here. We'll pick the conversation up on the other side. I want to take you up on your offer from earlier on in the conversation to talk about some of your, I think you called them foibles. I think in the book, maybe this says failures, but let's, let's go there a little bit on the other side of the break. I'm Than Bennett in for Bill today, having a great conversation with my guest, Barry Rowan, and we'll pick it up on the other side. This is Susie Larson, host of Susie Larson Live. You know, for 75 years, God has been changing lives through Faith Radio. To celebrate 
you could win one of the 75 Faith Radio birthday boxes filled with Brant Hansen's new book, Life is Hard, God is Good, Let's Dance, and a new Faith Radio t-shirt and some other fun things to help you grow and commemorate this important birthday. You are an important part of the family. And on this special birthday, you get the presents. You can enter to win yours at MyFaithRadio.com. That's MyFaithRadio.com. It's the Afternoon Show. I'm Than Bennett in for Bill Arnold today, having a great conversation with Barry Rowan about business, especially how to use business as a follower of Jesus and how to use it, uh, how, how God wants to use it through us as a way to do his work. And, and by business, we've been talking broadly about how to use whatever station in life, whatever your employment or way of making a living is for that purpose. Uh, Barry, I, I mentioned this before we went to a break, but I want to I want to ask you about failure. Uh, business just inevitably includes some missteps around the, along the way. Uh, we talked about this a little bit earlier. You've clearly had a lot of success. For those who weren't tuned in earlier, one of Barry's turnaround businesses sold for ten billion dollars. So a lot of success there. But I'm, I'm sure there's been failure mixed in. You said that as much earlier in the conversation. How do you think about failure in business and and how do you think about it, especially as a follower of Jesus? I think it's really important to have this part of the conversation, Than, because we don't talk enough about it, you know, as achievement kind of courses through the veins of our society. And uh, so as we were talking about, I was involved with building eight businesses over my career. Six out of the eight were successful. Uh, two were not. And so I often talk more about the ones that were not because I think we can learn as much from them uh, or more. And I think God is uh, at least as present in those situations as in the successes. And so first, let's talk about what is failure and how do I define failure? I think there are only two ways to fail, to fail to try and to fail to learn. So if we're just sitting on the bleachers, I think that can be a form of failure. And 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 if we go through something, it doesn't turn out the way we had hoped. Lord, what is in this for me? So I'll, I'll bring that home with a couple of practical examples. So the biggest failure of my life was one of these businesses that was a large-scale startup in Brazil. And this company had won the license to compete with the incumbent phone company. Brazil at the time was the eighth largest economy in the world, and it ranked 80th in teledensity, a number of homes for households. So the government rightly said, we want to get more homes to these households. So our company had won that license. It was a private company. The way we won the license was to commit to build out service to 80 cities in two years. So it was a massive startup. We raised two and a half billion dollars, hired 4,000 people in two years. It took off like a rocket. Uh, this, we put on 500,000 customers in the first 10 months. It was the fastest growing company of its kind in the world. The stock price tripled in the first year. We filed to go public. Uh, I mean, it was all up and to the right. Uh, and then uh, for the rest of the story, as Paul Harvey would say, uh, mm -hmm. the capital markets crashed. Um, uh, we couldn't go public. We saw some cracks show up in the operations. I got recruited to be the CEO and moved to Brazil. Uh, and it was the most difficult thing I'd ever done. We had to lay off 1,500 out of the 4,000 employees in order to mm -hmm. save the company. By the way, we didn't have a single lawsuit. We went above and beyond to uh, provide outplacement services and do everything we could, but that kind of wasn't the point. Um, but the real, but and we ultimately sold the business, but it was for dimes on the dollar, and so the investors lost money, including us. I felt that we should invest in this. One, I believed in the business, and two is I felt like if we're going to raise this much money, I wanted to be ethically, e ethically, I wanted to be welded at the hip with our investors and. So we lost money too, but the but the business failure paled in comparison to the spiritual anguish that uh, this failure brought me into. And uh, in hindsight, I, I realized that I had made failure, I had made achievement my God. Hmm. And it wasn't until the failure came that I realized a big part of my God went with it. And I just read Job over and over <laughs> in that hmm. space and and could see that God was just again, calling me to respond to Jesus' words, any of you who does not give up everything he has can't be my disciple. And I said, Lord, I've given up everything. And Linda would say, we're digging dirt here, Lord. And I had moved to Brazil without the family and was giving everything I had. And But God, in his uh, 
wisdom and in the high standards that he has for us knew that he wanted needed to reveal this God of achievement that had been hidden in me and had has dwelled next to this deep longing for him within me, uh, these kind of uncomfortable bedfellows ever since I was a small child, really. So out of that came uh, really a crucifixion of my own pride in this uh, crucifixion of the God of achievement. And the next part of everything for me was, was I willing to give up any claim on my own future? Was I willing to live fully in the present moment and let God unfold the pattern of my life as he saw fit? And, and after saying no, no, no for a long time, I finally said yes. And then out of that came a complete surprise to me, which was that I came into this sense of freedom that I was always, you know, plan your work, work your plan, start with the end in mind. And I'm a huge planner, but I, out of that came a deep understanding of the integration of planning and surrender. And now you talked about being slaves to our to-do list. I see the things that are on my to-do list as God's call for me in the moment. Lord, this is my best sense of what you would have me do right here, right now. And I'm going to live fully in this moment um, that God establishes the work of our hands, as it says in Psalm 90. And the work of our hands is to do what's in front of us to the very best of our capability. And uh, out of that came this freedom that I had never experienced. So, so it's all to say that uh, God does use our work to do his work in us. But as at the potter's wheel, you know, these are very strong thumbs of the potter. <laughs> and he makes us into a shape that seems best to him. And for somebody who has a steely strong will and a deep drive, uh, it takes a lot of force to press that clay out into the shape that is ultimately a receptacle for the living God, that our essence is our emptiness. So we need to be emptied of ourselves so that God can fill us with himself. And that was the lesson of Brazil. Uh, and then, the, yeah. No, go ahead. Go ahead. Well, the second failure was was more minor, but it was a, an opportunity to use my business skills to really explicitly improve the planet as well. We were developing renewable fuels, and um, uh, that business uh, did well. We perfected the technology, but then the oil prices went from $120 a barrel to $27. <laughs> it mm -hmm. uh, kind of put a little hole in the business model. And I would just tell you one story about that, about the integration of the word into us. I was in in London. We'd gone to visit an investor. Uh, we were going to raise uh, tens of millions of dollars from them, and they said no. And coming out of that, I thought, wow, this is going to completely uh, kill the business plan. And I, as I'm sitting in the hotel at the Heathrow Airport at 1.30 in the morning, and I'm just sitting with Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane, and I see Jesus, as we all know, go from anguish to resolve, from tears that were, no, not tears, sweat that was like drops of blood. There were no tears. It was a warrior. And he, but he went from that anguish to saying, let us go. And I realized I too need to go from this anguish and this pain to the resolve. And in that moment, I, I knew what we needed to do. We needed to pivot to the agricultural side of the business. It meant we were going to have to uh, uh, downsize the company to save it. And we did that. But it was it was that parallel experience of Jesus that showed me what I needed to do as difficult as it was. And so those failures cause God to deepen in us in ways that are beyond what we could imagine. And I'm a much better human being as a result. That's so good, Barry. And I think the book is a lot stronger by the fact that you have included those in there. So I appreciate your vulnerability to that. Uh, with that, uh, we, we're running out of time here. Just a couple of minutes left. Maybe just one more question. Have about maybe a minute for you to respond. But I, I know you have recently retired, and we've been talking mostly about work. So how do how do these principles translate to retirement? What do you do with these principles now? Yeah, well, first, I don't believe in the American definition of retirement. So we are move, moving into what, what my wife and I describe as an encore calling. And my dad just turned 100 this fall. And as I mentioned, he and my mom are both veterinarians. And he hung up his license when he was 96. So that's kind of my model. So um, as of, in this next season, we're investing in three things, the family, the poor, and uh, Christ-following leaders who are called to live fully for God in the world and we're doing that through multiple lines of service that include serving on boards, corporate and nonprofit boards, 
walking with the poor, writing, speaking, teaching, and what I call holistic accompaniment, coming alongside people to walk together, uh, to live fully for God in the world. So I am as energized about this work and this season of life as I've been in any part of my life and plan to do this for the balance of our lives. So I'm very energized and excited about whatever's next. That's beautiful. Congratulations to you on that. I uh, appreciate you spending some time with us today and I uh, just wish you God's blessings and thank you for being here. Thanks, Anna. It was a real pleasure. Enjoyed our conversation very much. Barry Rowan, ladies and gentlemen, his book is The Spiritual Art of Business, Connecting the Daily with the Divine. You can buy it anywhere books are sold. And don't forget to go to barrylrowan.com to download the online resource to go along with the book. Uh, friends, Barry's given us some some wise morsels to chew on here. So I want to go back to where we started. No matter where your station is in life, maybe you're in business, maybe you're in something else, but God has a plan for you and he wants to work through your work. So let's take the principles that Barry has given us. Let's apply them uh, to the glory of God. We are grateful to Barry for spending some time with us. Looking forward to hour two on the afternoon show. I'm Than Bennett and that hour, hour two, it's just ahead. Thanks for listening. Programming like this is made available through your support. Information available at MyFaithRadio.com.